Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ma ba'd Continuing on in our lecture or our lesson about uh, the summarized chapters of Creed we reached the point where the sheikhs would begin to speak about the chapter of worship and he began by saying worship it encompasses all sayings and deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with, whether apparent or concealed. And this is taken from the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, who said, Al-ibadah huwa kullu ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardahu min af'ali wa aqwali uh, so this is taken from the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah where he says that worship is uh, inclusive of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with from uh, sayings and acts of worship which are open and which are concealed so which are, are, are open on the limbs for example uh, salat Zakat is also a type of worship that is apparent when you pay zakat openly. Uh, Hajj has physical aspects. And they all also have a, a component which is intrinsic or uh, not apparent. And this is the component, component which it refers to the intention, to the niya. That this is also a part of that worship. And those acts of worship which are not apparent, which you cannot look at someone and judge necessarily what their uh, actions of the heart are. For example, things like tawakkul, like relying solely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or um, uh, many, many different other forms that, re that, re that require the heart and are from the heart. Muhabba, for example, also love, sincere love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, with your intention and having the love that is to the level of ibadah, that is to the level of worship. This is also a matter of the heart that no one is, uh, is able to ascertain whether you possess those characteristics or whether you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that fashion or not. Only you know this and your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are just some of the actions which are the actions of the heart. So then the Shaykh went on to say that worship is built upon two foundations. The first one is sincerity in the religion, uh, sincerity of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet wasallam said, in the bin yad, verily actions are tied to the intentions. So that whenever we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, if you are going to pray, if one is going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make salat. What distinguishes the, the salat from exercises per se, you know, someone who does certain yoga poses, for example, the, aside from the actual movements and so forth, but it's the heart. It's the heart. It's the intention that we have an intention to go and perform this prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our intention is on doing it for the sake of Allah and worshiping Allah alone. This has to do with our sincerity, with our intention. And of course, the actual way the, pra the, the prayer is performed also differs with exor differs than exercises. However, someone who is unaware of how Muslims pray, they may believe that it's almost a type of exercise because it involves prostration, it involves standing, it involves... Um, uh, the you know you know and sitting and, and so forth all the actions of the prayer and since they are physical actions but they also they require the heart those are all parts of worship and they all require that we have sincerity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we do it and we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone so this is what distinguishes the salat, that's one of the many things that distinguishes the prayer from, for example, exercises or doing those various poses without the intention to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the other pillar of worship 
is following the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, this with regards to the example of the prayer, also is um, is relevant because when we pray, we first we have the intention, and also the way in which we pray, those actions were done by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said, "Sallu kama ra'itumuni uh, usalli." The Prophet ﷺ said, Pray as you see me pray. He ordered us, so that's a commandment from the Prophet ﷺ, that if you want success, if you want your prayer to be accepted, then you will pray in the manner that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ prayed, and not in a new fashion. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulu bidatin dalala. He said that all innovation is misguided. So then if a person were to try to come closer to Allah with a new type of prayer or they were to, to try to actually increase the number of uh, prostrations in the prayer or raka'at or raka in the prayer then this would actually nullify their prayer it would be rejected as the Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith which is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha qalat sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد وفي رواية من عمل أملا ليس عليه أمرنا فهو رد. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi said, as as was narrated by Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها, the mother of the believers, أم المؤمنين. She said that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say, or that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, whoever innovates in this fair of uh, in this matter of ours, meaning the religion, will have it rejected. And in another uh, narration, whoever does an action of innovation in this uh, affair of ours or in this religion will uh, then is rejected. So it shows us that trying to differ with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, Alaihi goes against this pillar, this pillar in worship. The first pillar, as we mentioned, is that we have sincerity to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that we have ikhlas in our niyyah. And the second pillar is that it is in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So there is no new forms of, of worship. For example, I just saw on the internet where they, uh, the non-Muslims, an actual uh, academic institution in the UK, along with the Shia, have decided to celebrate the Prophet's Muhammad Sallallahu birthday and put that out on the internet and, and have a social function and a gathering and, and lectures and so forth uh, around this topic. Well, when we look in the history of Islam, we will not ever find that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, celebrated the birthday of Jesus, celebrated the birthday of Moses, celebrated the birthday of Ibrahim, or any of the Prophets, alayhim, after salatu wasalam, nor did he celebrate his birthday, salawatu rabbi wasalamu alayhi. And nor did the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, ajma'in, celebrate the birthday of the Prophet وسلم. This is not mentioned in hadith, it is not mentioned in athar, that are, are sahih, nor did this, the, the tabi'een or it's ba'a tabi'een. They didn't do this. So this is not an Islamic practice to celebrate birthdays. And even more specifically, celebrating the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ because it has a resemblance to those people, to those uh, societies which went astray before us. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Men minhum. Whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. And the Prophet ﷺ also said that, that you will follow the way of those people who came, uh, who came before you. You would follow them even in, the, uh, even in the hole of a lizard. If they entered the hole of a lizard, you would follow them. And then the companions, they asked, Men, he, men whom ya Rasulullah? Oh, oh the, the, the companions, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they said, Al-Yahud wa Nasa'i. Uh, ya Rasulullah, Al Yahud wa Nasara, O Messenger of Allah, the Jews and the Christians, and the Prophet وسلم, responded by saying, For men, who else? Who else? Meaning that we would follow all of their celebrations, we will follow their dress, we will follow their manners, we will follow the things that led them to destruction and led them to deviance from the true path of Islam in which the original followers of Jesus and Moses and, and the other prophets والسلام, were upon. That we would follow them, we would follow their their sunnah, the sunnah of those people who went astray, not the sunnah of the rightly guided ones. That's exactly what the Prophet sallallahu indicated for us, and also that hadith also was uh, narrated in the context of another uh, uh, hadith where it, in, it it referred to shirk, 
that the ummah would fall into shirk, which we, we see is, is prevalent in the ummah. As we mentioned, people are uh, celebrating the Prophet's birthday. Okay, that's a bid'ah. That's an innovation in the religion. But some people go to the extent to in their celebration that they try to make tawassal with the Prophet wasallam. They supplicate to him. They try to draw nearer to Allah by the Prophet wasallam by worshipping the Prophet wasallam, Not by following his sunnah. Ahl sunnah believes in tawassal by the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, by following his sunnah, by growing the beard as the Prophet ﷺ ordered us, by having our thobes short as the Prophet ﷺ commanded us and warned us against having long thobes that uh, are in the uh, hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, told us to follow him in prayer. So we pray like the Prophet ﷺ. All of these are acts of worship and they are in accordance with the second pillar as we mentioned, which is the second foundation being that you follow the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So we have to stay away from innovative practices. And again, to quickly uh, uh, go back over, worship is built upon two foundations. The first one being sincerity to Allah, that you have ikhlas in your intention. And the second one is that you follow the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam in all acts and worships. Uh, that you do anything related to Islam, you follow the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How he, uh, uh, how he interacted with other I individuals, how he uh, supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Try to follow his uh, supplications that are mentioned, or uh, definitely how he prayed sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How he made Hajj, how he fasted. All of these actions are mishroor, and they are an, uh, they are an obligation upon us to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, to follow how he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because didn't he know Allah uh, better than us? Isn't he the best of mankind who knew uh, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Of course. Why? Because revelation was sent to him, the final revelation, which is the Qur'an. Then the Shaykh went on to say in the, in the next chapter, he said the three types of tawheed. So tawheed is, has three categories. The first one is the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship, Tawheed al rububiyyah It is the oneness of Allah, the Almighty, in his actions. For example, creating, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole creator, providing and sustaining everything and giving it life and death and ordering all affairs, and that he is the Lord of all creation and is over all things om omnipotent. This is uh, Tawheed al rububiyyah the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's lordship. And the second category of Tawheed, of Islamic monotheism, is the oneness of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. And it is the oneness of Allah in worship, outwardly and secretly. As we mentioned that worship, it has a an, uh, an internal component or you know issues that relate to the heart. For example, isti'ana, isti'adha, wistighatha, you know, seeking hope and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and having love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of these are actions of the heart and they only go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we worship only Allah so when we have uh, do these acts of ibadah they are only to Allah we rely solely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we supplicate solely to Allah and the outward components meaning like the prayer and supplicate supplication and so forth. So the Shaykh, he said, it is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship outwardly and secretly through speech and action like supplication, vowing, slaughtering. When you slaughter animals, you say, Bismillah, Rahman, uh, Bismillah, you know, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, and you slaughter the animal. And also having uh, khushur or khashiyah or uh, Khudur in your ibadah, in your worship, so that, that you're fearing Allah and that you're hoping for His mercy and that you are depending, making tawakkal and you are uh, solely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you desire that your needs be met from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you have this uh, uh, raghba, you know, a rahba, wa raghba, and all these acts of, uh, of worship that you desire that your your supplication is answered by your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you have fearfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that inaba and that you have repentance to your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are you're you're, you're uh, returning back to Allah for the sins that you that that you've committed and that you are seeking repentance only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the state of the the affair of the believer because we differ for example, with the Catholics who go to their priest 
and, and, and so forth and seek repentance from him. Oh, Father, I forget. I, I, I have sinned, they say. Or, you know, they'll go and they'll go to the, to the cathedral or the church or what have you, and they will confess their sins. I've killed someone. I've done this. I committed adultery. I've drank wine. I've, I've done whatever. And they confess their sins to their, their priest. And then he is the one who is either responsible for forgiving you and saying, go ahead and, and tell and, 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 and as if he has this power to intercede on your behalf. However, the believer, the Muslims, we don't, we reject this concept in totality that the prophets, they set the example for us that any of us can come to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet وسلم, himself repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than a hundred times a day. And they were, he was forgiven والسلام, for anything minor that he may have uh, uh, committed. And the Prophet والسلام, were the best of mankind. And they were forgiven for what they did before and what they would do uh, uh, after. They were totally forgiven and they were the best of, of humanity. And so this is the example for us uh, as human beings is that we return. So if they are forgiven for anything that they might, any mistakes they might have possibly made that were minor, then uh, what about us? We need first and foremost to come to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek uh, repentance. So this is a type of worship and it only goes to Allah. And it worship, uh, Tawheed al is the aim of the call of all the messengers, all those prophets who were sent to their specific people. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent to his people first and to all of mankind. That their aim was, uh, is, is, is uh, verified for us in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رُسُولًا إِنْ نِعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَجْتَنِبُوا تَعْبُودُ تَعْبُودُ uh, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I've sent to every, and we have sent to every nation a messenger to worship Allah alone and stay away or be away from those things which are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to disbelieve in those things which other people worship. For example, those people worship rats, those people worship idols, those people worship statues, those people worship rocks, those people worship trees, those people worship saints, those people worship uh, uh, prophets, those people who worship um, trees and the sky and the sun and the moon, Muslims are away from that. Muslims do not worship graves. Muslims do not worship the inhabitants of the graves. Muslims do not worship the dead. Muslims do not worship the living. We worship the only one worthy of worship, La ilaha illallah. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The Shaykh went on to say, then mentioning the third category of Tawheed, he said, the unity of Allah's names and attributes, Tawheed al-Asma'i wa Sifat. And it is the affirmation of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed about himself in his book and what his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, affirmed in his traditions from amongst uh, his names and attributes according to what is befitting for him without changing them, distorting their meaning, without negating them, and without asking how or anthro, uh, anthropomorphism. So, Ahl Sunnah, we believe in Tawheed, uh, Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat, that the divine names uh, and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses, we believe in them. We believe in them as they came in the Quran, and we believe in them as they came in the Sunnah of the Prophet. For example, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ar-Rahman ala ars istawa that uh, Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, he uh, ascended above, rose above his throne. We say as Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose above his throne, as he subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. We don't ask how, we don't negate it, and we don't try to explain this characteristic away. We don't. However, other groups and sects have fallen into this, and this is some early innovation in Islam, where some individuals like the Mu'tazila, the Jahmiya, the later, the Asha'ira, and the Kul uh, Kulabiya, and many other uh, sects in Islam, and some of them fell out of the fold of Islam because of their deviance, that they began by distorting this very concept of Tawheed, the divine names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they were influenced by philosophical beliefs. They, at this time, a lot of the manuscripts and things related to the Roman and Greek history 
was not at the, uh, you know, was not easily accessible for the Europeans. So the Arabs and Arab philosophies, philosophers and so forth, they were, began translating these, these texts. And this, by translating and trying to transmit and preserve these texts, it, they began to become influenced by these ideologies of Plato and Socrates and others, and their concept of, 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 of the beings and the universe and a supreme being and so forth, they began to be influenced by these ideologies and they took some of those ideologies into Islam and tried to Islamicize them. From this is where you began the deviance and to where some of them uh, deviated so far that they just left the fold of Islam. They no longer were Muslim because they had left the principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uh, affirmed for himself. They negated it. And what the Prophet sallallahu had affirmed about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they negated it and they distorted it. And they uh, made a likeness between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his creation, which Ahl Sunnah, we, re we reject this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is is not like his creation, nor is creation is like nor is his creation like him, as he negates this for himself in Surah Al Ikhlas. That there is none, uh, there's none that uh, resembles him. There's nothing like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also says. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran also that there is Laysa uh, that there is nothing which is like him or nothing that resembles him. And then so Allah makes nafi there, he negates, as we mentioned in the Kalima to Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha is a negation, illallah is uh, affirmation that there is no God, that there the only God worthy of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayat as we will find all throughout the Quran uh, there's this same concept of negating false worship and affirming correct worship so here in the beginning of the ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says laysa kamithli shay which means that there is nothing that resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means nothing in the creation nothing resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we don't make a, a resemblance between uh, uh, Allah Tabarak wa Taala and His creation, Wahuwa Sami'un Basir. Then Allah affirms for Himself that He is the All Hearing and All Seeing. Now, the observer will take a look at this and say, "Hey, wait a minute! Allah hears and sees, and we hear and see, and animals hear and see, but." Allah negated Laysa Kamithli Shay, letting us know that Allah's hearing and the creation's hearing, they don't resemble. There is no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears everything and sees everything. We are limited in our hearing and our seeing, as well as well as all the other creatures. Some of them are blind, in fact. We are limited in our attributes. We possess attributes of hearing and seeing. But as Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, Lays Kamithli Shay, our hearing and seeing is not like Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. He's he's all of his names and attributes are uh Kamal, are, are are perfect, and there's no nux, there's no imperfections, and there's no limitations. Whereas we are limited. And on top of that, we would never make the resemblance. We would never say Allah sees like this or Allah hears like this. We 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 don't have the ability today to 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 articulate this or even uh, claim this. We can only say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect in his name and attributes and we stop where the text stops. We stop where the Quran stops. And we stop where the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stops. That we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all hearing and all seeing. And that's sufficient for us. To know that nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is he is all aware of all things and his knowledge encompasses everything. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the three concepts of Tawheed that the Shaykh was mentioning. The first is Tawheed al rububiyyah which is the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second one is Tawheed al uluhiyah which is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And the third one is Tawheed al asmai wa sifat which has to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine, the unity or the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names and attributes. That he possesses divine names and attributes that are perfect and unlike his, his, his creation, 
uh, the created beings, which are limited in their characteristics and uh, flawed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship. And Allah subhanahu ta'ala is the Lord of all things and the creator of the heavens and earth. Then the Shaykh went on to, to mention in the next chapter, he began by talking about the types of ways people deviated in related to the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine names and attributes. He said, distortion is to alter or misrepresent. And it is of two types. So there's two ways in which the sects, uh, some of the early sects in Islam, and of course they're still with us like the Asharis, the Asharites, they still uh, have this, uh, they distort the names, some of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we'll give an example as the Sheikh mentions. So he said distortion is of two types. He said distortion in Lafdiya, which has to do with uh, the word itself, meaning that like the Asharis, they, they distort the saying of Allah the Almighty, Estoa ala arsh, as we mentioned, Ar-Rahman ala arsh, Estoa. So, rolls over the throne. And Allah rolls in the throne, over the throne, in a manner that suits His majesty. We don't know how. We don't ask how. We just say He rolls over His throne because He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, said He rolls over His throne. So, the Ashadis, what do they say? They distort this, left, left the end. They distort this by distorting the actual uh, the word istoa. Instead, they say istola. They read the Quran like we read the Quran. Ar Rahman al Ars istoa. But when they explain it, they explain it by saying uh, Allah seized the throne. Istola. You know, this is how they they interpret it. So they interpreted the actual word in Arabic, which is spelled with a alif, uh, sin, ta, wow, and ya. They, instead of the, they spelt it, or when they uh, try to explain it, it's, they add a lem. They add a lem after the wow. So this right here is a distortion or a, uh, a distortion in the actual left. A distortion in the actual, uh, the actual word itself. They, and then the second type of distortion is to distort in meaning. So actually they fall into both. Distortion of meaning is changing of the apparent meanings of wording, like the saying of the Ashadis about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes of anger or desiring and vengeance and changing the meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands to mean power and blessings. Because Allah mentioned that he has hands. This is, we stop there. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, and, and the Prophet Sallallahu says in uh, authentic hadith that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, that he laughs. We say he laughs. We don't know how, and we don't make a resemblance between the creation. Allah says he rolls above the throne. We say, hey, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala rolls above the throne. This is the belief of Ahlus Sunnah. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed us. This is what the Tabi'een and the the Sahaba, the Tabi'een with Tabi'at Tabi'een. This is what they were upon. They didn't go into in depth about these issues. They stopped there. They stopped where the text went because they knew that was the safest way. Not to go in. If it wasn't explained by the Prophet ﷺ, then it wasn't necessary for us to go into that matter. We don't ask how. So uh, another aspect of going astray with regards to these divine names and attributes is denial. And denial is to reject the attributes of Allah or to separate some of them, to distinguish some from others. For example, number one, denying the attributes from Allah and denying them completely. That is the total negation, which we find the Jahmiyyah sect, they negate it. They say, yeah, Allah, uh, you know, he has these names, but there's no meaning to them. He is Ar-Rahman, he is Ar-Rahim, he's the most merciful, he's the most beneficent, without mercy and without ben ben uh, being the, the greatest, the, 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 uh, have another attribute. So they negated in totality those attributes. They affirmed the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those names, but they negated the attributes in totality. That's one way in, in which people deny the uh, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in totality. The second type is denying some of them, like the Ashadis, who do not affirm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes except seven. So there's only seven which they affirm. The rest they negate by distorting the meaning. The 
Then the Sheikh went on to mention the next chapter, and this is Munasib, before we stop uh, and in uh, uh, this lecture, that we mention the next two chapters because they are still related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names and attributes and very imperative for us to uh, understand and uh, to, to study these at the same time. And of course, restudy and revisit these uh, these concepts, which are the concepts of Ahl Sunnati with Jama'ah. So the Sheikh went on to say in the next chapter, he said, Description, a takayyiv. So Ahl Sunnah also, with regards to the divine names and attributes, we don't ask how. So we, takayyiv is to describe how an attribute of Allah is, or narrating an example. For example, like someone saying, Allah descends to the lowest heaven like this, and like this. We have no authority. To, to say that. We don't know how. We know that in an authentic hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يَنزِلُوا رَبُّنَا تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَلَىٰ كُلُّ ثُلُّثَ اللَّيْلَ الْآخِرِ فَيُقُولُ إِلَىٰ آخِرَ حَدِيثِ That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest third, in the, in the last third of the night, to the lowest heaven. And then he asked uh, the angels questions about what uh, the people are doing, you know, what the people who are worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are making tahajid, the, the, uh, the, the, the night prayer, what they're doing, and who's seeking his forgiveness, and so forth. Although all this knowledge is, is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he subhanahu wa ta'ala does this. This is one of his af'al. <coughs> af'al. These are one of the actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, and he descends. And Ahl Sunnah, we don't ask how. We don't say he descends like this or like this. He descends in a manner that suits his majesty <coughs> out of his perfection, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know he does this because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not a liar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to be believed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to be followed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was truthful and we follow and believe the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we don't ask how. We don't say, oh wow, that doesn't fit my intellect. And it doesn't forget for, befit his. It's not befitting to his or her intellect. We we don't, you know. Let's just negate that. Let's just throw that hadith away. Abidin, never. This is not the way of Ahl Sunnah, and this is not the way of Ahl Islam. This is not the way of the people of Tawheed, the people who worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But rather, they affirm what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala affirmed about Himself, and they affirm what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam affirmed about Allah in authentic hadith, as long as it's proved to be a sound and authentic hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, another way in which the sects deviated with regards to the names and attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is by making comparison, uh, temthil. And temthil is to ascribe a likeness among the creation to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That is by making them equal in every aspect. Okay, we were just speaking about this uh, about five minutes ago. And while tashbi is resemblance in ascribing equality in many ways, but not all. Or a resemblance in many ways, but not all. For verily, this leads to ascribing equality in all characteristics. We have hands and Allah has hands, but we do not know how his hands are except that they are perfect. And this is the the, the qaida. The, the, the principle that we affirmed already is that Ahl Sunnah, we, for example, those attributes uh, like seeing and hearing, and Allah has hands, and Allah descends, and Allah rose above his throne, we affirm them. We don't know how they are. We don't make a resemblance between his creation uh, and, and him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we affirm those attributes. We believe in them. We believe Allah does those things, and Allah possesses those attributes. And although we have attributes, <clears throat> for example, we have hands, we see, we hear, but ours are not like, our characteristics are not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our attributes are not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes. His attributes are divine and they're perfect and they're unflawed. Where we are flawed and we are limited and we don't know the how, the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. We just affirm them as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirmed them and we know that they are perfect and they are uh, that he really sees and it really is the all seeing and he really is the all hearing this is what we affirm about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the aqidah or the creed of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah 
the people who follow the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, like the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, with the bad Tabi'een. So Ahl Sunnati with Jama'a, the Shaykh went on to say, affirm the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and affirm the meanings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes as they are in reality, described in the Quran and the Sunnah, and entrust the knowledge of how Allah here bears these uh, characteristics, these attributes, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows himself subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, the, and has the knowledge of how his attributes really are but we are limited in our knowledge and we're nil, limited in our capacity to acquire this knowledge and to be able to handle this knowledge and all of this knowledge goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> then the shaykh went on to affirm uh, mention in the next chapter about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in, in this book the creed he said the way the people of the Sunnah understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes are as follows. And this is what we've already uh, mentioned. And this is just a brief recap. Uh, and the Shaykh went on to say, Number one, they affirm what Allah has affirmed for himself in his book or upon the tongue of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam as previously mentioned. Number two, they reject the imperfection and unbefitting attributes Allah rejects about himself in his book or through the hadith of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and at the same time they affirm the total perfection implicitly indicated by the opposite of that imperfect attribute as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about himself la takhudu sinatun wa la nawm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not uh, sleep nor does he rest so ahl sunnah as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates this about himself, he negates that he rests and he negates that he sleeps. You know, we don't believe like the Christians say that Allah uh, rested on the seventh day. You know, that he had to rest after creating the heavens and earth. We don't believe that. We don't believe Allah requires rest, nor does he sleep. And he negated that for himself in the Quran. And so, Ahl Sunnah, we affirm that. We affirm that he does not sleep and that he does not uh, uh, he does not require wet rest and he does not eat and so forth and at the same time we affirm his total perfection which is implied by the opposite of that that Allah is al is al hayul qayyum that he is the all the the all uh, living and he is the you know he is the one who uh, is he's always in existence and he is the provider and sustainer and all creatures are dependent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need him. We are dependent upon him. And he gives life and he gives life and he gives death. But we cannot dictate or determine anything for or about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in need of him and he is not in need of us subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third thing the Shaykh went on to mention, he said that Ahl Sunnah do not affirm nor reject any name or attribute not implicitly mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah. Instead, they ask its meaning, and if it carries a false meaning, non attributable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they reject it. And if it carries what is true and befitting of Allah, they accept it. So we'll end there in this sitting, and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. And bless this sitting to be a blessed gathering. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with amnathia, ruskan taybu, amalan muttaqabbilan, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad.